Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Red Planet Live. I am your host, Ashton Seth. I am elated to be hosting the Mars Societies podcast and leading the conversation about human exploration of the universe and the future settlement of Mars. As a longtime space enthusiast, I am passionate about STEM education and making humanity an interplanetary species. Thank you, everyone, for joining today and supporting Red Planet Live. So today's guest uh, is actually a returner to Red Planet Live. Uh, this will be his second time on the podcast. Leonard David is a space journalist, author, and freelance writer who has reported on space activities for over 50 years. His work has been published in a variety of media sources, including space.com, the Financial Times, Foreign Policy, Astronomy, Space News, and his own blog, Inside Outer Space. Leonard has also written or co-authored numerous books over the years, including Moonrush, The New Space Race, published by National Geographic in May of 2019. Uh, Mr. David has also authored Mars, Our Future on the Red Planet. And this one's pretty cool. Uh, Leonard has also co-authored a title with Apollo 11's Buzz Aldrin called Mission to Mars, My Vision for Space Exploration. Thank you, Leonard, so much for being here today. Terrific. Love to be here. Thank you for having me. Excited to chat with you. Well, before we dive in, as usual, just have a couple Mars Society announcements to share. Uh, the first is don't forget to save the date. The 2024 International Mars Society Convention is taking place Thursday, August 8th through Sunday, August 11th at the University of Washington campus in Seattle. Go Cougs. Speaking of the annual convention, the Mars Society is calling for abstracts. Presentations for the annual international convention are invited. Abstracts between 150 to 300 works can be uploaded to the Mars Society abstract page on the Mars Society website. Please note that the deadline for submitting abstracts for consideration is Friday, June 28th at 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Lastly, one more, uh, the Mars Society is hosting its annual poster design contest. So if you have a knack for creativity, graphic work, love Mars, space exploration, this is your chance to shine. The winning design will be used as the primary promotional graphic for the annual convention, again, happening August 8th through 11th this, uh, this August. And to enter, just put together your poster design that captures this theme and send it to postercontest at marssociety.org no later than Wednesday, May 15th, again, 5 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. All right. And all of those things uh, are listed on the Mars Society's website. So check that out for more details. All right. So let's dive in. Uh, Leonard, like I mentioned to you before, uh, on the podcast, I have a segment called Question of the Day. So this is just meant to be an icebreaker, no right or wrong answer. Uh, but I thought from one interviewer writer to another, uh, I thought this would be fun. So today's question of the day is, if you could interview any space or science person, who would it be and why? Now, I know you have a long resume and you've already done, you know, spoken with many before. But if you could interview any space or science person, who would it be? Somebody alive, I assume. <laughs> You know what? Uh, I'll leave that up into interpretation. Maybe they've passed uh, and you didn't yeah. get a chance to speak with them. Who would it be? Wow. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest with you. I don't have anything that jumps out at me right now. I, I, I'd like to sit down with Bill Nelson, the NASA administrator. I think he's in hot water. And uh, even though he's cool when he talks, you got some hard. That, that guy's got some issues uh, budgetarily and NASA and uh, all the other the Mars sample return. He's got a lot of programs going on at once. And listening to him the other day, I, I've interviewed him once, but I, I would like to get back and and uh, do a sanity check on how he's doing. Uh, He's been in the post now for a little while, and uh, yeah, I, I'd say he's uh, this last budget, uh, even though it's, I guess, fairly big, it, he's got some real issues uh, to deal with, and uh, that would be an interesting conversation. Also, Lori Leshen is uh, one of my favorites uh, from uh, head of JPL. Mm -hmm. In fact, I hope to be talking to Lori next week uh, about Mars sample return and, and the whole JPL. Jet Propulsion Lab uh, uh, layoffs and, uh, you know, mm -hmm. how does she feel uh, 
walking into that position and, and having so many things uh, go a little bit awry. Sure. She's got some great successes already, uh, getting some spacecraft off, but she's uh, another person's under duress. <laughs> so if you are getting the chance to speak with Lori next week, is there going to be a, an article published on, on your blog about it afterwards? Can I yeah, look if it? everything goes right, I'll, I'll uh, let you know. Uh, okay. Yeah, I, I'm just negotiating on the time when we can do it, and she's busy, and I'm busy, and we're trying to sure. find a time. Yeah, but really, you know, that's a really important uh, interview. But yeah, I, I think, that, you know, one of the interview. Let me go back in time a little bit. One of the pioneers that I really uh, got to to know was Kraft Ericke. He he was an early a pioneer in a, vi a vision like von Braun and you know some of the older uh, rocketeers and he lived in uh, San Diego and I did and I was working for Omni magazine at the time mm -hmm. so I, and I sent him a letter you know because the internet wasn't there but I and he said yeah come on up I live over here in La Jolla and we sat in his back uh, patio with his wife serving tea and talked about his vision of the future. And that was a really uh, uh, great, you know, he was uh, fundamental in making the uh, Centaur, Atlas Centaur work, okay. which was having, was blowing up, you know, things were going awry, but, uh, but he had a grand vision of where he thought politically, legally, sociologically, psychologically, where we're going. Mm -hmm. I, I know that was a real riveting time for me to, to listen to somebody with that uh, grandeur of the space agenda ahead of us. Okay. So you got a couple. Okay. Got a couple yeah. of options. It sounds like the, it's in the works. If you can get the, a time narrowed down, that that's like a yeah, simple. yeah. Well, he, well, he's gone. Uh, Kraft Eric, he's gone. He, right. he's, he's long gone. But uh, Laurie is uh, going to be there, and Bill Nelson's. Uh, like I said, uh, they're in sweatshop operation now, as far as I'm concerned. They've got to, they've got to deal with the budgets and uh, programmatic over, uh, you know, oversubscription and uh, 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 Laurie Glaze is the uh, really the a, a glue to at NASA headquarters that uh, gave a great talk the other night at the Lunar Planetary Science Conference in uh, Houston, Texas. They just wrapped that up last week. Mm -hmm. But Lori, she's got to stand there in front of all her space science uh, public, right. uh, where she really uh, uh, matured herself and explained how tough the budgets are and what tough ch uh, choices are coming mm -hmm. uh, and it's not going to be easy. So uh, she's another uh, uh, bright star in the, uh, in the constellation of worried people, <laughs> you know, with dealing with budgets and, uh, and the future. Sure. Yeah. There, there's a few of those. I'd have to say for myself, uh, if I could interview anybody uh, at this moment, it would be astronaut Kelly Girardi. She's one of my favorites. She's been, uh, significant, you know, impact in, in my life, uh, and, and being on this STEM career uh, trajectory and in, in a way, a catalyst for me being here today as, as host of the podcast. Um, I've got her oh, other side, her book over there, um, yeah. which was influential in, in me volunteering, uh, to help with the Mars society and then, you know, how I got this opportunity today. So would love to speak with her. Uh, that's that's a, a bucket list item. We're still working on that. So that would be my yeah. question. Well, that would be great. Yeah. Great. Cool. Well, I want to remind everybody, if you have a question for Leonard, please put those in the chats. I'll try to sprinkle those throughout our conversation. Uh, you know, we love audience engagement. So if you've got something, send it our way. Uh, but wanted to start the conversation with you, Leonard. Um, you know, as I mentioned, you've been an author and a writer for over 50 years reporting on on space activities. And I think I'm sure everybody is curious. You know, you've witnessed a lot of uh, remarkable milestones in space exploration in that time. What has been, you know, the, the most significant breakthrough or, or moment uh, that you remember during your time as a journalist? Um, I, I, I guess... 
you know, for me, I, I again, I lived in California in the early my early days, and couldn't get to Florida. I, I, I couldn't uh, uh, do much on uh, you know all the things that I was selling to the community there, the neighborhood about picking up trash or or gardening or whatever to get to Florida to see uh, Saturn V launch. And so mm -hmm. I never got there, but I did in 81, we, I got, uh, I was working for uh, the National Space Institute at the time. And uh, uh, they flew me uh, to uh, Florida to see the first shuttle launch in 81. Mm -hmm. And seeing the shuttle uh, go, the first flight, because you didn't know what was going to happen. Mm -hmm. They're putting people on this for the first time. They're not going to, you know, the shuttle didn't go up uh, uncrewed before. So it's mm -hmm. it's plugging two people in there, and they had supposedly ejection seats that they could get out. Mm -hmm. But seeing that go, uh, and I did think at the time, my God, we're here. This is it. The shuttle, reusable. It had all the buzzwords. Mm -hmm. You know, fly back, airplane-like operation it had shut tiles it had coming back lands in in the desert uh, and i was lucky enough to get out to the landing of the first shuttle uh, in uh, at edwards air force base and that was a pretty and seeing bob uh, or uh, yeah crippen and young uh, uh john young get off that plane and walk over to the podium where we were standing and go we're here it works great <laughs> you know and you just thought well it's all this is it we're this there here yeah yeah all the buzzwords of the things we were after uh, uh for reusability and uh shuttle airline like operation and and there we go now the downside of all the shuttle stuff was uh on a bad day was columbia loss of columbia uh, yeah. uh, and I covered that for space.com mm -hmm. and going to Houston and, and sitting there for a lot of the, uh, uh, mishap, uh, board, uh, trying to glue together what happened. Yeah. And it was a puzzle. I mean, they're there. And, uh, and my memories of going to bars in Houston, and meeting serendip, you know, uh, I couldn't talk about the people I met, mm -hmm. telling me what was going on inside, trying to put the tree together, uh, the the disaster tree. I mean, if this happened, then that could have happened, and then that could have happened, mm -hmm. and kind of everybody was in a funk. I mean, it was they lost their family. Yeah. Uh, and that, that was pretty tragic. Uh, that was, and then another high point was, uh, the night that the, uh, Hubble telescope, uh, was defocused. I was at the Hubble Space Telescope Science Institute and, um, uh, uh, Gene Shoemaker and Carol Shoemaker were there and, uh, some scientists and we were all sitting there waiting for whether or not the Hubble was going to be okay mm -hmm. because you know previously they promised us a look at the face of god with that thing mm -hmm. and so we're all like oh my god is this thing gonna ever be uh, working and a woman ran in i probably heidi hamill i think uh, ran in with a bottle of champagne is all i remember saying it works we got the picture oh. it was in focus it was incredible and that was that was a great moment Mm -hmm. There's a lot of them. I just so many. A lot and of guys. I'll see some more. And yeah, yeah. What what would be next on your you know your bucket list of things to report on? I imagine you know humans getting to Mars would be one of those. But anything else that that you want to see and, and report on? Uh, yeah, human uh, mission to Mars would be you know a, a dream. Mm -hmm. uh, I just, now I'm just hoping we can get people back on the moon. I mean, you know, I'm, yeah. I, I, you know, living through the Apollo program and, and not mm -hmm. only that, that, but the Mercury and the Gemini and then Apollo and Apollo Soyuz. We just lost Tom Stafford here the other day. A great, uh, a great, uh, I got to meet him at one point and he was, 
as everybody knows, he was terrific. He was mm -hmm. an amazing guy. Um, they were all amazing. Um, so yeah, see, but I think getting back on the moon would be uh, with humans and how that's really going to happen. I mean, mm -hmm. what are we going to do? Are we going to rely on the starship? Is Blue Origin going to come out of the out of the blue with their uh, lander device and be the one? I don't yeah. know what's going to happen. Something's coming. Something's coming. We got there. There's angst in the system, and I, I think NASA is going to have a, a reflection on where where the Artemis program really is right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, we we're, we're seeing a lot uh, in the news about Artemis getting delayed. You know, Artemis two next uh, next people to the moon, including first woman, person of color, and, and all of that is getting a little bit delayed. Um, so. I was wondering, is there a difference when it comes to reporting on, um, you know, government-led missions versus like private sector commercial? You know, you think about like NASA versus SpaceX and Blue Origin. Is there a difference when you're reporting on on those two two sectors? That's a great question, and it's a good thing to reflect on. Uh, we're we're definitely going through a transition phase where it's you know a lot of non-NASA things happening. Right. I mean, dealing with the Indian. Uh, space research organization. They have a whole different kind of uh, public affairs. Uh, Israel has, you know, they're going to get back in the moon business here, I gather, with another lander. But then we've just gone through some private initiatives with Astrobotic mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the Intuitive Machines. Right. Yeah. And so you have a different, there's a different feel to it compared to NASA. Uh, I'm not sure at this point I know whether it's good or bad, but I, there are definitely different types of uh, communications that these groups are uh, offering. I'd say in my mind and my view, uh, Astrobotic did a, a, a really good job of communicating to the media and the public mm -hmm. what was going on. Intuitive Machines, interesting. I'd say he, they, they kind of overshot their uh, PR and uh, they had more issues there than than we were led to believe. But uh, on the other hand, they got down on the surface and skidded across and broke their legs. And uh, they're going to get up and, and keep going. So, uh, but that's a good question. I think there is a different tempo uh, compared, you know, NASA fed stuff. I mean, it's, you know, God, the Internet is just, you can go to any NASA center and there's so much stuff. Mm -hmm. you know, and after a while, you can't even keep track of all the websites and, you know, from, right. so I guess I, uh, I'm not complaining. I'd rather have the information available. Right. Yeah. You know. have more than have less. Yeah. 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 I, ha I have a goal. Uh, you know, I, I work for a technology company. I sell automation software. Uh, so I balance, you know, tech and, and space and science at the same time. Uh, and so I have a goal for myself to read a, a space article, something in the news, whether it's a, a new space company or, or something significant has happened, like intuitive machines landing on the moon. And sometimes it's like just information overload. I don't know where to look. It's like I, there's a list of 10 articles I'd like to read today. But, you know, with, with time constraints, I can only get to maybe one or two of those. Yeah. Do you feel like that as well? Obviously, with the Internet, the exploding commercial and, and private space industry, do you feel like there's just so much happening? It's hard to know what's going on everywhere uh, it's sad to say but i mean you know, i'm 70 something how old am i barb my wife knows that's all she can uh, share it for you. 75 76 in there um i remember having a fax machine that was a big deal and i remember the day that a fax came through from a, a group called iridium they were going to launch, I think, it was 66 satellites, you know, using Russian rockets, any rockets they could find, India, whatever. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the facts going, this is totally bizarre. How are they going to do all that? And here we are, you move up to today with Starlink and, you know, Elon probably in the last 10 minutes put up, you know, Another one. Another, you know, 77 Starlink satellites. So it's amazing to me what, and again, following all that live on the internet compared to a fax machine, it took, you know, a few seconds to 
give you the info and he, anyway the yeah the social media the internet has made a giant difference uh i think any reporter is probably on overload about what uh is available now and uh picking and choosing uh, article ideas and you know frankly one of the challenges i think today because there's such an output of stuff is trying to find articles that nobody is writing Right. You know, yeah. I think that's the one that I find more exciting is if I can get this out before everybody, I can sleep at night. I'm happy. Mm -hmm. This old guy, I, I at least got the right connection of people and I can get the story before anybody. <laughs> you, okay. know, you don't have that competitive feel to it. You're kind of, you know, lost in the uh, hubris of the moment uh, of journalism. But, um, uh, yeah, so getting all that social uh, impact. You know, I was on Mars today. I I went to the Perseverance and Curiosity Mars uh, sites, and I was on Mars. Okay, what's what's Curiosity looking at today? How's Perseverance doing? Mm -hmm. um, and you know, it's it's really uh, an amazing time now to be a participant to to watch success and failure and problems and uh you know your first-hand accounts of your you're there watching this stuff live mm -hmm. like like the uh uh the starship taking off the other day i mean it was amazing you know alon and the whole third flight of that uh you know it's up for grabs of how well it all worked but boy it worked well enough that uh, alon uh, can move to the next uh, fourth flight if the FAA yeah. gives them a go ahead. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah, wow. Well, speaking of, of Starship, um, I see we have a question here, and this is the right time uh, to to mix this in. So, question is from AC. Do you think Starship will eventually get us there, or be a disappointment like the shuttle? <laughs> Well, I don't think, consider this, you know, a disappointment like the shuttle. You got to parse that out. Economically, it was, you know, kind of a problematic thing with a shuttle. Mm -hmm. You know, they were supposed to fly, you know, hundreds of those things every hour. You know, that was what everybody was billing it for. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, I just looked at the Starship uh, site that uh, one of the groups has uh, live cameras. And, you know, they're cleaning up the pad, getting ready. To the next flight and uh, to, to his credit i i i'm with him i i think you know this iteration of failure mm -hmm. is, is a, a good thing and yeah. uh you know i i was old enough to remember how many atlas failures there were and titan things were going awry and it takes a while to get it right and uh and figure out why it's not working and so alan is on a pathway there to uh, fix it now the timing of this thing I think that's where NASA is going to have to crack the whip here. I mean, at some point, uh, you know, because I even the other day I heard somebody moaning about the uh, refueling in space of uh, the Starship mm -hmm. and what has to happen to get it to the, even to the moon. And so it's it's a cumbersome operation. So I'm not sure how this is all going to play out. But I think that's the drama of it all. Mm -hmm. You know, and god you know if it works it's great but making that routine and that's where the shuttle was going and unfortunately nasa believed its own pr and it was a routine and then all of a sudden foam's falling off and you lose a wing and you kill seven people and then you challenge her with an o-ring problem you killed another seven people so you know you can look at the shuttle program as you know a death trap uh, for some, but it really, uh, you know, having a shuttle like operation would be a fantastic capability. Again, airline like operation, we're going to get there. It's going to be the way we're doing space transportation today is I think, and, and there are days I think, Wright brothers, this is, we're at the stage where you have all these Wright brother type moments and you had all these competitors come in and they had a better engine. They had a better thing. Mm -hmm. the canopy won't fall off. You can actually sit inside, you know, all that's going to come about. And uh, I'm ranting here, but uh, uh, 
you know, I think we're going to, we're really at a kind of a, a, a very uh, turning point with space transportation. It's not going to be this way we're doing it. You can't put people on all that fuel and fly them out of here. I don't know if it's going to be anti-gravity or what's coming. My guess is something's coming. Mm -hmm. And I think phys the physics is changing, and I think we're going to see some dramatic new capabilities and propulsion that yeah. will make Starship and make uh, the way we're doing rocket transportation look pretty black and white. Mm -hmm. No, I, I completely agree with you. Uh, and, and, and that's part of the reason that uh, the Mars Society is establishing the... Uh, uh, Mars Technology Institute is is to develop that type of technology, specifically fuel and energy, uh, so that we can get humans to Mars. So I like you know how you've connected it to to the Wright brothers. I mean, when they were the first ones doing it, you never would have projected or or foreseen that you know 100 200 years later we would have commercial air, uh, you know airlines and aerospace like it is that you can just buy a ticket to anywhere and. You know, it, it's become so uh, so regular, so routine, so normal to take flights when at one point uh, that wasn't even conceivable. So, yeah, I, I agree with you that at some point, once we've been able to figure out the kind of the nuances and how we make this repeatable and cost effective, which is, you know, part of why the commercial and, and private space industry is so crucial here, because uh, we're at a pivotal moment where we're going to see it expand and it's going to become you know, taking a flight to the moon may eventually be like hopping on a flight from, you know, Washington to Florida. Going to go yeah, visit. The, uh, you know, watching the hypersonic uh, activity going on right now, that's pretty interesting. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, right now it's more a warfare kind of thing. How do you get a, a you know, a, a bomb or H bomb to somebody quickly? But I think the whole uh, technology of hypersonics is moving along, and that's something to watch. Uh, China apparently just the other day started crowing about uh, they got a test track for a kind of a magnetic levitation launcher. This is something with, that NASA has been uh, fooled around with uh, numbers of years ago. And uh, yeah. and uh, you get back to Jerry O'Neill, and we're talking mass drivers and using uh, – rail guns on the moon to launch uh material uh into uh you know some uh, l5 orbit and then uh, you use it or make it make solar power satellites or what do you ever want to use mm -hmm. but you know so yeah there's always been dreamers that's for sure but you know yeah. technology's got to catch up right the materials is changing space elevator i'm still uh you know, I'm what I want the up button on that one. Yeah, uh, I got a feeling some of that's going to turn out to be very valuable in the future. So I, I, I'm saluting all those advanced efforts. Yeah. Speaking of advanced efforts and dreamers and innovators, uh, I'm curious to get your thoughts about X Prize, uh, a yeah. little bit about you know its history um, and how that led to to where we are now. Yeah, that, I mean, that's it's sort of getting forgotten in a way, but XPRIZE, uh, Peter Diamandis, uh, you know, was a really kingpin there of pushing that. And actually, Dan Golden at NASA headquarters embraced that activity as well and got behind it. But uh, Peter, of all the people uh, that I got to know, uh, there was three of them. There were three people that I met in a bar in Washington, D.C., Peter Diamandis, um, Bob Richards, Todd Hawley, three pioneers um, uh, uh, that were there. And it, what struck me was not their intellect, but they were all the same height. I didn't <laughs> understand how these three, <laughs> they must have met themselves, you know, somewhere. And they all agreed about creating something called the International Space University. Mm -hmm. they, they they were the ones that got that kick started. But Peter went on to create the X Prize and uh, really beat the hammer down solid on uh, innovation, private groups. Come and show us what you can do. Let's all meet in New Mexico. Uh, we, they had a great show out there several times of bringing all these private groups together. Mm -hmm. Many are no longer 
you know, they're no longer armadillo. There was a bunch of other groups that they they all morphed into something. I think not all of them, but some of them. And but the people were really important. Uh, they were really uh, uh, really uh, innovation. And but uh, Peter deserves a real uh, salute by everybody to to uh, have you know been the spark plug early on privatization of space and mm -hmm. uh, he's a he's still a very active uh, talent out there mm -hmm. yeah that i i think more and more we're starting to see those ideas uh come come to light and you know one of the things that you mentioned earlier about uh like the fueling process for for starship i believe it's is it rocket labs or maybe it's Vast. I can't remember off the top of my head now when I'm, I'm put on the spot. But there yeah. is a company that is looking to develop essentially gas stations in space right. so that when Starship is making those journeys back and forth, it has an opportunity to stop and fuel so that it doesn't hit orbit fab. There we go. Uh, so you don't have to make the, the direct trip. Um, you don't have to carry yeah. all the fuel with you. Is that something that you think is potentially realistic? And is that uh, potentially something that we could see here in the future? I'll know more in a, probably about two weeks <laughs> because I, it's one of my uh, article ideas I'm working on. I want to go back and try to look at rocket refueling and in space. We've had some demos, mm -hmm. even on the shuttle, they had a demo that I think they pump water back and forth just as a fluid transfer kind of concept. Yeah. But I, I, I need to go back and, and do a 101 for me and uh, write an article about where we are today with the companies. Yeah, these private groups are saying that NASA's interested. SpaceX may have a, you know, they attempted, I guess, some kind of uh, 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 demo up with the Starship uh, on the way down, coming, screaming in when it reentered. Uh, or previous to that, but uh, anyway, uh, so yeah, we're, we're making it uh, happen. I, I do worry, the only worry I got, I always look at, you know, God, what can go wrong? That's why the curmudgeon part of me always shows up. I have to fight it. You know, you don't want one of those gas stations to blow up. Sure. And yeah. uh, so safety of, of propellant transfer and the hardware and can it take a uh, internal problem and still be viable. I, I hate to see shrapnel everywhere and we'll have more. And then, then we have to have the orbital debris uh, garbage collection group come up and try to pick all that stuff up. But, mm -hmm. but I think we're, we, it's clearly we're, go, we're going in that mode. And yeah. uh, the Air Force is very interested in cislunar space activity. Uh, they want to refuel whatever their classified programs are doing. Yeah. So uh, yeah, it looks like money's available to think this through and, and uh, hopefully we'll see some progress. Okay. Well, I, I'll be looking forward to uh, your update two weeks from now. Uh, if you've got yeah, one. Don't, don't hold me to two weeks. <laughs> okay. I'm hard time for uh, so going on now. <laughs> right, right. Uh, but speaking of kind of some innovative ideas here, I see we've got a question that says, would tunnel boring machines to build habitats be the most cost-effective method of construction and resource extraction? Down on the moon or Mars or anywhere, I would assume. Uh, on the moon and Mars, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, well, yeah. I mean, people are, you know, maybe that's a, a ulterior motive of the Lama's boring company. Uh, you know, once you get that technology, people are looking at, you know, all kinds of habitats on the moon that either you go underground because of the radiation issue or you try to use the regolith on the moon or mars to cover your habitat mm -hmm. so yeah i'm lucky to have gone and we'll be going soon to another meeting at the school of mines here in colorado i'm up here in the mountains in colorado and uh, the school of mines down there uh, in golden has got a tremendous team and they have uh, really some very creative ideas and they're pumping money into uh, some projects there that uh, will make make a real big difference on excavation and uh, but the only uh, again the curmudgeon factor is you know you, it's great to write all that and then you got to start thinking well 
one thing that's missing here is actually doing it on the moon. We got to start testing some of these great ideas. I, I'm, I'm a sucker for artwork and uh, because of, uh, that way people don't have to read all my crazy words. They can look at the picture and I write a, a good enough caption. They get the whole thing. Mm -hmm. uh, don't tell everybody. Um, but, you know, we got to start testing this stuff on the moon. There is no way to understand the dynamics of the lunar environment down here. We try to piecemeal a bunch of models together and computer runs and doing little tests and simulated lunar, you know, regolith and all that. The real true test is on the moon, all of it at once, one sixth gravity. What's going to go wrong? <laughs> what can go right? Uh, is yeah. there something we've really missed here that can help us? Or is it something that uh, we're not even aware of yet that uh, is going to turn, you know, even surviving the night on the moon has become a big deal. I mean, these, we've seen the Japanese landers slim. Uh, it, it, it survived, you know, a 14 day uh, lunar night. Uh, the uh, intuitive uh, machines, lander they hope to resurrect the lander again after 14 that's coming up soon and we'll see but it's it's uh the, and and uh so getting on the surface and trying things out and this is where i part companies with a lot of the let's go to mars now i you know we're back to where the basics are if you can't do it on the moon if you can't figure this out on the moon, I, I'm not going to commit astronauts to go to Mars and figure it out on the spot. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I'm kind of on that page where the moon is is the window to Mars. And I think NASA's finally gotten that in their uh, vision statement. And unfortunately, the administrations come and go and the you know who knows what the next administration is going to be and and what kind of vision will they have uh f for the long haul uh they're going to go oh, asteroids or something which obama sort of did through it through it through it through the whole thing off in a kilter for mm -hmm. a while um so anyway i'm rambling again sorry <laughs> well, of, uh, speaking of the moon, you know, we've talked about private industry, commercial, uh, but let's shift gears a little bit to national interest. Um, yeah. And so, you know, prior to, to today's conversation, I was, uh, you know, doing my research and I was looking at some of your books and, and reading some of the reviews online. Um, and I was looking at um, the book uh, Moon Rush, the new, the new space race, and specifically about China. So you've written a lot about China's uh, space program in recent years. How do you view the challenge and competition between the U.S. and China and, and the efforts to get back to the moon? Well, I think it's the real story. I mean, China is coming along. I, 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 they're about ready to launch a relay satellite or explode it or something happened. I, I, I thought they were going to launch today or to, tonight. Maybe it's tomorrow morning. I, I'm not sure. But there's a, a lunar relay satellite that's critical for their lunar exploration goals. Mm hmm and uh, that's going to be launched by china but they have a pretty uh no we're we're in a point in my view um it, it, you know i'm old enough to remember sputnik i mean you know i i saw the upper stage that launched sputnik come over texas when i lived there and back in 57 that was a pretty that was a pretty interesting sight to see an artificial object something mm -hmm. that humans built up there mm -hmm. And uh, so we're at a point where, uh, um, what was the question again? Let me I, get back About to About China core. and the space race, the new space yeah, race. Yeah, I, I, we're at a Sputnik moment is what I was trying to get to. That's what I was trying to remember. You know, back then it was a 184-pound satellite launched by the former, now, Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, ours only weighed 30 pounds. Explorer one and that was right off the bat people were going we're in a space race theirs is heavier you know <laughs> and today we're all trying to get you if we can make 30 pound satellites that'd be great mm -hmm. um 
So, uh, yeah, we're in a splitting moment. I think there's a real space race. I think uh, Bill Nelson, the NASA administrator, is playing the China card as much as he can up on the uh, Capitol Hill, trying to get more money and stabilize it. The question I have for Bill Nelson is, you know, he's got to start looking at NASA and how it spends its money to begin with and whether or not we need all those field centers and whether or not it's, uh, you know, working as a unified uh, space agency mm -hmm. or it needs to be restructured uh, is, is to me where we're headed. And because uh, there's just not enough money. And you you mentioned the public, uh, you know, a lot of the public is not aware of any space race or whatever, but all of a sudden China does this or that and they're going to go, well, where's our program? What are we doing? Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, I, uh, I, th I think we're kind of back to beep, 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 beep. Uh, there's a signal coming out of China that's pretty much like the Sputnik. Mm -hmm. uh, and we better pay attention to And what it gets down to for those political science people out there. It is capitalism versus communism. It's back to the basics. It's, it's the China bragging about how their system is better than the U.S. They're on track, they're on time, they're moving out, and uh, you, you see Artemis slipping year by year. Um, and so, okay, at some point, you know, is China going to be there waving at the astronauts, you know, as they try to attempt a landing at the South Pole or, mm -hmm. you know, and... Um, I don't know where it's going to go, but again, that's why I love this stuff. <laughs> yeah, right. It's exciting. Keeps you keeps you invigorated. Uh, oh yeah. And, and interested. I, I agree with you. I think it's kind of like the second coming, the, the second space race. It's again the U.S. versus uh, large communist country. Where we're you know facing China now to get back to the moon. Obviously, there's a few other players there. Um, yeah. We, we see Japan. Um, we see India as well. But really, the two powerhouses there, you know, China and, and the U.S. getting back to. to yeah, I keep an eye, you know, uh, I keep an eye on Russia. You know, the, the, their talent there is still there. Mm -hmm. And Putin, uh, I try to monitor as much as I can about Roscosmos, their Russian mm -hmm. space agency. Yep. They're about ready to launch a brand new heavy lift booster, the Angara, mm -hmm. uh, uh, advanced Angara. And that that's a big new capability for Russia and they want to have their own space station. They're kind of waiting, you know, they're kind of part of the problem with the international space station in the sense of uh, having leaking modules and oxygen disappearing and whatever's going on up there, but that thing's getting old and we don't know exactly what the uh, lifetime of a space station is. We never had anything quite like this. So, you know, I'm not saying it's time for bubble gum in the airlock to try to fix things, but there's stuff going wrong. And Russia has already committed themselves to their own space station. China's already got one up there. There's three people in there right now as we talk. Mm -hmm. They're getting ready to launch another crew up there. They have now they're, you know, cycling uh, their people through. So it's, and then you think the private sector space stations, where are we going with those? Yeah. Axiom is working hard. There's a bunch of them that have got new ideas. I don't know. It's, it's just a, you know, break glass, roll dice. I don't know how it's going to play. It's great. We've got lots to write about, lots of topics to cover. It's endless. Yeah. It never, it's never a dull moment. <laughs> right. That, that keeps us entertained. Well, uh, speaking of the space race, I see we've got two questions from Jennifer here, so we'll try to tackle both of these. Uh, do you think this race back to the moon is reminiscent of the Cold War, and do you think it will motivate our space program budgets? Yeah, I think that's what's happening. I, you know, uh, I'm getting fond again as I get older every year. Uh, you know, it's the context of the times. You know, I lived through the the space race, the official, you know, kickoff of the space race with Eisenhower and Kennedy and, you know, you know Nixon going through and, you know, uh, yeah, I think we're at some interesting 
uh, moment in time about a space race. Now, the cool thing, and there are things happening that have not been reported too much. Um, um, there's little uh, working agreements now between China and the US on exchange of lunar samples. Uh, they're bringing, the China is about ready to launch in May another return sample program to the moon on the far side and bring back samples that nobody's ever seen, you know, kind of thing. And it looks like, you know, uh, NASA has worked out some kind of arrangement so uh, U.S. researchers can have access to these lunar samples. Mm -hmm. My hope is that they better have this in play because if the if China comes back with Mars samples way before the United States, are we going to see a similar type of agreement? Mm -hmm. uh, so and but you know again Mars is so diverse, so big, so much interesting. Pascal Lee here the last couple of weeks had a great uh, finding of an old volcano with glacier potential ice underneath. Uh, you know, Mars is so crazy. You know, there's so many things there that uh, we can tap into that keeps our motivation going about exploring that place. So I hope, um, you know, one thing that may come out of the Mars sample return, and if they don't, I'll be critical, uh, they're going to have to come up with backup plans. I think we better have a low cost Mars exploration program and we can do a lot with low cost. Mm -hmm. Those samples, if China's bringing them back, not to say they can't fail, which it, it may, you know, they could do it. And they're practicing on the moon, the same kind of uh, philosophy of technology that they're going to use at Mars. So, uh, you know, it's not to say they can't fail, but I, I'm not quite sure I need the samples back. It's not that urgent to me right now, and I'm still worried about Andromeda strain and a lot of other issues that seems to be uh, latent in the whole Mars sample return program that they're going to have to address uh, before we really uh, see the U.S. program go forward. And what is China doing for black contamination? Mm -hmm. You know. You know, we don't need another Wuhan lab uh, escape uh, problem if that's what happened uh, for COVID. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, so what are they thinking about bringing Mars samples back? I have not to this day, and I've tried, who's the who in China that knows about Mars return sample and back contamination? Who's the person? Yeah. What group's looking at it? Mm-hmm. Thank you, Jennifer, uh, for those two questions. I see we've got another one. You, you mentioned low cost mission. Uh, so this question is from Michael Lane. Uh, what does a low cost mission look like? It's cheaper than, than 10 billion. That's all I know. Sure. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> that's one thing. But I think uh, there, there's a kind of a move on with a uh, new uh, Jet Propulsion Lab did some early work on a program called SHIELD which is, is sort of a nose cone like thing that you can deliver uh, mini rovers or other kind of devices, seismometers, all kinds of things and shoot those everywhere. You know, lob them out to Mars and let them do uh, kind of a, you know, uh, look at different types of environments on Mars, including the polar caps, which are gonna be fascinating. Um, so yeah, low cost is for me is anything below 10, 10, 11 billion bucks for a Mars sample return that, that makes the uh, geology community just excited, you know. But what about those exobiology people and astrobiology and some other people that are doing stuff? Oh yeah. Uh, their, their turn's coming. Oh yeah, we've, we've talked with a couple of those. We In uh, January, spoke with uh, Dr. Graham Lau, astrobiologist, yeah. and that was a, a great conversation as well. Um, yeah, yeah I think there, there's ways that we can look for life on Mars. And to this day, I'm not convinced that Viking didn't find life on Mars in 1976. And we, uh, you know, maybe we're smarter now to take that data, whatever data is left, 
uh, to reanalyze it, but uh, it's conceivable. And there are some people in the Mars community that are pretty uh, you know, strong-headed on this, that maybe he uh, that experiment did find life. Mm -hmm. So we'll, we'll see. So I think there's ways to lob. I mean, if the question is life on Mars, I'm sick of hearing about it. Let's get to the answer. Is there, is it dead? Uh, can you prove it? It could be somewhere up in the caps. It could be, you know, some leftover Martians hanging around in biology, you know, somewhere in a crater or it's underground or you got to drill. I just wrote a story for uh, space.com on, uh, on honeybee robotics, a private mm -hmm. group that has yep. some great ideas, you know, uh, on uh, drilling deep on Mars and looking for life and, and uh, looking for water ice. Uh, what's in that water ice? Yeah. It's an exciting time and, and we're waiting for, for answers. And I love how assertive you are. Like, we just, we got to get to the answer. We got to, we got to find out yes or no. No, I'm too old. I can't wait. <laughs> been waiting long enough ready for an answer oh yeah um, well let's see I, i've got a couple other questions um you know from your perspective as an author but i want to make sure that I, I ask this person's question uh which is is there some group technology entity that people should be keeping an eye on that not most journalists or is on most journalists or space enthusiasts radar now why would i tell you that <laughs> Because the, we're we're the in crowd right now. This we're yeah, well, among friends here. I'm in with the in crowd. Wasn't that a song somewhere? Um, no, there are there are groups. You know, I frankly uh, the one that I and I've not met uh, the head of it, uh, Peter Beck. I guess is it Peter? Yeah, uh, with Rocket Lab running Rocket Lab. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Man. Uh, they're they're making some headway there and uh i'm very fascinated by uh, uh beck's and rocket lab's interest in uh private uh planetary exploration particularly at venus mm -hmm. and uh, they've already uh, uh got a uh, uh, potential of having a mission in early next year working with uh sarah seeger at mit and and the group there on a low-cost planetary Venus um, probe that can at least get to uh, look into the cloud system of Venus and see if there's anything uh, very odd there that could be uh, a, a possible, uh, uh, you know, uh, habitat for life. So that's exciting. Uh, private groups going off to Venus. I'm I'm for that do it and uh you know they've, they've already proven all the hardware this uh varda industries that just uh, landed their capsule in uh utah uh after doing some pharmaceutical run up there uh that was all controlled by the rocket lab and uh, uh so the pieces of the puzzle for venus are there and uh it looks to me like you know uh, that's a very that's why I, I don't want to give you more detail. <laughs> no, there's stuff going on there that's really exciting. Keep an mm -hmm. eye on those guys. Yeah, we talked about that in January with, with Dr. Graham Lau about Venus and and yeah, the potential for life in, in the clouds of Venus. Yeah, we talked about that. Um, I know we're we're coming up on time, and so I've, of course I've got so many questions, but just not enough time. Um, you know, I wanted to talk about uh, one of your books, uh, which is currently in my Amazon cart, Mars, Our Future on the Red Planet. And I saw that it had great reviews online and I was reading through some of the view, uh, reviews and they were overwhelmingly positive. Uh, my question to you as, you know, a, a longtime journalist, media person, author, how do you react to negative criticism, especially in the digital age where there are endless internet warriors who all have, you know, an opinion that they want to share online? How do you react or, or deal with potential criticism, people that are have different ab opinions or ideas on, on about what you're publishing? Poorly. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> no, no. If you think you're the only one that knows everything, you're crazy. You know, I, I depend on my uh, criticisms of people or you didn't think this through enough. You should be doing this. People send me story ideas. I mean, they, they mm -hmm. criticize me, but they, you know, 
I'm lucky where they go, you ought to think about this. And I think about it. And so mm -hmm. that's been real helpful. Uh, you know, if you, if you ever think that you're the know-it-all, it ain't happening. <laughs> and there are just so many people now. Uh, I'm very fond of uh, Everyday Astronaut and Scott Manley and yeah, some of these yeah. people that are just doing great uh, videos that dissect things. And I learn, I look at those, and man, I'm, I'm in awe of what they can do. And then you've got an entire community of satellite watchers that will tell you when the X-37 mystery Air Force space plane changes orbit. Mm -hmm. You know, and people are out there doing all kinds of, you know, citizen science things that uh, uh, way, way before NORAD, you know, <laughs> I don't need NORAD. I got these guys on my uh, internet uh, profiles and they just send me all kinds of things. And uh, I just, uh, Bob Christie in, um, in England, I was uh, curious about uh, something the other day. And uh, this is a guy, I don't know how old he is. He may be older than me. He came from uh, following Sputnik, but he, he uh, is just one of these uh, unbelievable uh, orbit analysis guys that, uh, he sends me stuff and I go, Bob, cut this to the chase. Exactly what are you saying here? And so he's great. He comes back with uh, some great quotes. And uh, but yeah, so I'm up for uh, anybody that finds that I'm off the uh, limb on things. And uh, I just don't saw too fast. That's all. Sure. OK, so you're saying be open to feedback. Oh, yeah. Um, Got to be. But don't take it too seriously. Um, speaking of. You, you know, everybody has an opinion. Um, you know, a lot of people online think that they are uh, experts, well-versed, and they know what they're talking about. Uh, but that leads me to the ideas about ChatGPT. So writing yeah. is a challenging skill and you've done it for a long time. Do you see that the creation of tools like ChatGPT is potentially going to hinder um, the work of authors um is it an existential in issue for yeah. journalists uh, should they rely on these tools or is it inherently better um for men that are authors meant to not use chat gpt what are your thoughts on this i don't have anything you know it's like ai chat you know people say you know i've got when it started getting out there more in the public eye, I had people saying, well, you might as well retire. This is going to be AI chat. Uh, they're going to write all the stories. There's no need for you in there. But I, I'm not sure I'm there or that. I don't, I'm not, I don't use it. I have actually had some scientists uh, send me chat, you know, with their, their thoughts through that. And it was okay. But, uh, you know, when you phone them, it's a different story. You, you've you got live, you're asking them, you know, there's tricks that journalists can do. One of the things I was taught by some preeminent journalists in Washington, D.C. was if you're in an interview and you're fading out, you can't even follow what the hell the person's saying. You just pipe in and go, you don't really believe that, do you? And they think you you caught them on something. They think that you know more than they do because they're covering up something. And you wouldn't believe how well that works. <laughs> okay. They backtrack and all of a sudden you're getting fresh quotes out of nowhere and you're going, my God, this guy's, she's, she's been lying to me, but I can tell now what's going on. I'm gonna have to the uh, so, uh, back pocket for for yeah, next. Yeah, you gotta. There's some tools of the trade that I don't think Jet uh, Chat or AI is onto yet, but maybe they will be. But there are tools that any journalist that's been doing this for a while is to, you know, uh, uh, make make uh, your interviewer uh, wince a bit. You know, that's the best. You know, because I've got I've got uh, interviews where I know they were lying to me. You know, and uh, we get back to it, and uh, yeah, they they try to correct themselves. <laughs> well, hopefully, so, I haven't uh, I haven't made you wince too much on on today's conversation. No, it's been a, a lot of fun, and I, I 
sorry if I've carried you back too far in history here but all the time, but uh, yeah, there's just so much happening. Great time to be a journalist. I recommend it to anybody that uh, wants to write. Uh, pick your passion and go for it. It's great. Yeah. Any uh, as we about to wrap up today's episode, um, any advice or tips for people that want to to follow in the same footsteps? They want to be a space reporter, journalist. What advice would you have for them? I, I, the first thing is probably just go and look at the people that you really like to read, find those people. Uh, and there's so many people that are just uh, Jeff Faust at Space News. There's uh, Arc Technica. There's just so many great reporters out there doing wonderful things. Mm -hmm. Pick pick, uh, pick the ones you like to read. And I'm not saying copy, but emulate with how good they are. Mm -hmm. If you can find that special spark. But if you're into this, if you don't have a story and you don't feel like I'm on to something nobody's got, if you don't ever have that, then you probably go somewhere else and do some other thing. Like you got to have some spark that says, hey, God, nobody knows this. I'm the only one. How fast can I type this up? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and, and, and uh, then you then you have to go through the editors, which is, <laughs> you know, you never know what's going to happen. I got great editor, editors or, you know, gods and maniacs, you know. Uh, uh, there are, Lee Billings at Scientific American is one of my best uh, support guys. He's a tremendous editor. Uh, uh, Space.com, Brett, uh, Mike Wall, uh, uh, all those guys are terrific. Um, so I haven't had a bad run, but there are every once in a while on the books, you know, you wind up, you know, you're really going through your paces on books because you got National Geographic there going, they don't want a lawsuit on anything. Right. <laughs> so so you, you, you can't, you can't, you got to be careful there, but uh, yeah, but it's, it's a, it's a great profession. Uh, you know, uh, I'd say the other thing to remember if you're a freelance writer, just remember it's freelance. You got to get paid at some point. Freelance is good if you're not getting paid to get your chops going. But at some point, you got to go, okay, the check is coming when? <laughs> I got a mortgage to pay here. Right. That's right. That's, that's a good tip. That's probably the best one of them all right there. Charge a fee. Charge a fee, you know, but you gotta you gotta get to the point. I the first article I ever sold, I sold to Air Progress magazine for $75. And I thought, my God, I'm retiring. This is great. <laughs> and here we are. And here we are. Oh, all those years later. Well, I think that is a, a valuable lesson uh, to everybody that that's listening and, you know, maybe has their own dreams of, of being a writer, a, an author, a journalist, a reporter, whatever that may be. Um, yeah. Follow your passions. Try to find a story that uh, somebody hasn't hasn't written before. Uh, I think those are are great themes to, to walk away with. So uh, I want to say thank you so much, Leonard. Thank you for being here. It was a great conversation. I really enjoyed chatting with you today. Well, thanks for everybody for chipping in on questions and you too. I appreciate all the thought you put into this. Thank you. Absolutely. It's such a pleasure. Well, thank you everybody that tuned in today. Uh, audience, you guys had great questions as well. I uh, want to close out today's show, which is, uh, again, a major thank you to everybody. Reminder, Mars Society uh, Convention's coming up, so check out the website if you are interested in uh, joining, submitting a poster. Uh, yeah, thank you to our friends at Liftport, Michael and Leah. Thank you for your help today as well. And I'm going to close out the show the way I always do. The best is yet to come. All right, everybody. Thanks. Have a good one. Bye, guys.